I'm Will Arnold. I'm Head of Climate Action at the institution. Um, so I leave on, lead on all of our work around sustainability in structural engineering. I used to be a practicing engineer with Arup for just over 10 years before I moved here. Um, and really my role on this project has kind of been one of convener, if you like. I don't consider myself a concrete specialist by background, um, but I am lucky enough to know lots of people who do. Um, so my job was to bring them together to help with the writing of this paper. Um, Mike, Paul and Nushin are three of the co-authors um, of the paper and with us tonight. We've got a few other authors in the room as well. Um, we'll show you who else was, was involved shortly. Um, Mike, um, who will be speaking first tonight, is a sustainability professional whose career goes back 30 years or so in this sector, I think. Less than more, at least, <laughs> he says. Um, he's currently head of sustainability at Clancy Group, which is a major contractor in the UK. Um, and he's going to be talking to us tonight about the sort of um, literature review type research went into the paper. Um, we'll then pass on to Paul. Paul's the global decarbonisation lead for Rambol um, and Rambol buildings sector, I believe, specifically. Um, Paul just got back from New York Climate Week where he was trying to convince world leaders to change what they thought about things like concrete, so hopefully that was successful. Um, and Paul is also one of the co-authors of the Low Carbon Concrete Group's route map. Um, and one of, there, there was a couple of them on this paper, so there should be decent overlap between the two. Um, and then finally, Nushin will get up and speak. And Nushin is the Sustainable Construction Manager at the MPA, Mineral Products Association. Um, she's got the slightly unenviable task of trying to steer the concrete sector towards a sort of net zero circular economy future. So um, we're all indebted to her for that. In a minute, I'm going to hand over to Mike, Paul and Nushin. Um, but before I do, just to sort of say a couple of things about um, the sort of background to the paper. We don't really need to look at that now. Um, the brief that we set ourselves, and this was nearly a year ago now, actually, so quite a long time has passed since then. Um, the brief that we set ourselves looked a bit like this. So we've got GDBS, Grand Granulated Blast Furnace Slag. Um, it's a co-product of iron and steel making. It's been used as an SCM in the concrete industry for quite some time. And there's a whole host of technical benefits to doing so. So there's reasons why we've been using it. Um, but in recent years, particularly in the UK, we have seen a rise in people asking for GDBS on their products as a cement replacement, specifically to try and reduce the amount of clinker that they're using because they're chasing sustainability goals, carbon goals. And so the question we wanted to ask ourselves was what the link was between this use of GDBS and global emissions. So we basically set off to look at the supply of both GDBS and clinker um, and understand what that means when you ask for more of it in your specifications. Um, and w in a minute, we'll sort of explain what happened on that journey. Um, like I say, there's a, there's a whole bunch of other people who contributed to this, to this paper. Plus, we had extensive review by members of the Concrete Zero um, <coughs> initiative. So there should be another sort of 70 names or so on this under the reviewed by bit. You can see that we come from a wide range of backgrounds. The, the hope is that we've sort of got enough cross industry um, spread on this, that we've come at it from different angles. Um, and there's a few people on here who sort of pulled in expertise off others along the way as well. The report itself that you've got in your hands has been endorsed by the ICE, by the Climate Group, um, by the Concrete Centre, which is part of the MPA, and by the Lower Carbon Concrete Group. Um, so hopefully that, that will give you the, you know, gives the weight to it so you can take it into design team meetings, you can take it to your, your clients, the contracts and the supply chain you work with, and you can use it when you're talking about this subject with them, and hopefully it'll be useful to you. With that, um, I'm going to start, I'm going to introduce our speakers and hand over to them one at a time, and um, they're going to take you through the paper. So, Mike, would you like to come up and start us off? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Will. Um, well, good evening, uh, everyone. It's great that um, we've got a good audience here and, uh, and online. We were a little bit concerned, actually, just uh, as we were standing here with an, such a nice evening, whether everybody would prefer to be in the pub beer garden uh, rather than talking about concrete. But so glad to, so glad, glad to, glad to see everyone here. Um, so as Will says, yeah, I'm just going to talk you through the literature review. And um, you know, it's taken quite some time to try and get a feel for uh, what the overall quantities of slag uh, uh, and Clinko are globally, so that starts to build up the picture of you know, where we think uh, the challenge lies. So we've gone to a number of uh, uh, you know, research 
uh, sources for, for that information. We don't claim it to be absolutely extensive. We've done what we can. So again, we'll be quite welcoming if anybody has any uh, questions about the figures or in a, in, it can point us to additional data sources, for example. Again, you know, we'll be uh, very happy to, uh, to, to see, see that information and we can build on, on the picture that we, uh, that we have. Um, all of these tables that I'm going to show you are all in your hard copy, and you can also see the paper on, online. They're just pulled out from that, so uh, there's nothing different here that, we're, that, that we'll, be, uh, we'll be showing you. Um, so starting off, the global uh, production of clinker to try and address this sort of ratio of uh, cement clinker to, to G GBS uh, availability. Um, so as you can see, we've, uh, we've pulled out three, three particular uh, reference uh, sources there. Uh, Sun Bureau van der Wegen, it's a, a Dutch, uh, Dutch publication and information from the US uh, Geological uh, Survey. Uh, the figures there for the cement uh, global production you can see on the, on, on the left hand side and how that translates into clinker production. Uh, again, I won't talk through all, all of the numbers. Two to note particularly though, you can see two figures there for Sun Bureau and the van der Wegen figure. Uh, for global uh, clinker production, which are slightly uh, a slightly lighter grey, uh, and that's because we didn't actually have the clinker figures for that, and they've been extrapolated from the cement global production, taking a, a cement to, to clinker ratio figure. Uh, and again, for those of you who are sort of quick with your maths, you'll notice that there's a little bit of difference there between that figure for the bottom figure there, 4,100, and the 3,800 and the other two figures. But it, it, it's a slightly conservative estimate, perhaps, but puts us, importantly, in the, in, in the, same, the same range for global uh, clinker production of that 3,340 to 3,840 that you can see at the bottom. So that's the clinker production, um, global clinker production. So what does this look like when we're comparing that with um, the availability of a GGBS? Uh, and for that, we've gone to these sources. Um, Harder, uh, that's Joe Harder of One Stone, um, who was commissioned to do uh, a, a piece of work on global GGBS uh, availability. Um, and he's a researcher in, in, in commodities. And CRU as well, which is a, a commodities uh, uh, research bureau. Uh, taken figures from them, and again, as you can see, some data from the U.S. Uh, Geological Survey. Um, so these figures, again, a little bit of variability in them, but in the right, you know, all in the sort of similar kind of ballpark, um, and, and the range showing between 330 and 407 uh, megatons per year. So now, the important thing, of course, is how that compares with that earlier figure of the uh, the cement uh, um, clinker production. So, if we look at the global GGBS utilization now, so we had a look at the production figures, and here's some sources, again, a couple of the uh, uh, ones that we've referred to before, the CRU and harder figures, uh, and also a couple of others there from uh, a, a Japanese and, and, and Chinese uh, source, giving an indication of the amount of uh, 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 slag uh, um, that, that, that's been, uh, been uh, generated. Um, so, some, some, some figures there, just to give an idea of how much slag tends to be granulated compared with the amount of slag that's actually produced. So what this shows is that a lot of the slag that's been produced is fairly highly utilized already globally from, from those production figures. And again, if you look at the percentages, again, from a different number of different sources, they're all, again, in the same sort of ballpark. So again, that gives us a fairly good confidence that of that, you know, the utilization figures are in that uh, sort of range. Worth looking at some future predictions as well um, here. So um, the harder report, um, it, it, it goes into a sort of fa you know, fair amount of detail on this um, and shows that there is likely to be an increase of around 15% uh, by, by 2030. Now, this might seem a little bit kind of uh, anomalous um, in some respects because we know that there's a global drive to uh, change um, the... Uh, uh, steel, steel production and move to uh, DRI and electric arc furnace. But what we're also seeing in that certain countries, there is still a commitment for uh, blast furnace, slag-derived uh, iron and steel, predominantly in, in India and a little bit in China. So although in certain parts of the world we're actually seeing a drive to reduce uh, uh, the uh, emissions through changing the steel 
production, we are still seeing that there is some increase in certain countries. So that's actually driving that figure up a little bit. But overall, if you look at it, not a significant change when we compare that with the amount of global cement clinker production. Uh, a final source here, the Global Cement and Concrete um, Association figure, again, predicting this increase uh, in concrete use uh, by, by 2030 um, compared to 2020 levels. Um, but again, it's in the same sort, of, same sort of range. And importantly, when we look at this global clinker ratio to GGBS ratio, this doesn't indicate that there's going to be a significant change in that figure over the next uh, uh, you know, 10, 15 years years or so. We've also looked at stockpiles because um, most of the GGBS as it's produced is, is actually uh, utilised. Um, so we wanted to see, well, if, if we did have a change in production or if the availability decreased, is there stockpiles around globally that could be utilised? Not a huge amount of information was available on this, but we did find a couple of, uh, couple of sources that do indicate that there is some material around. But again, in the overall s uh, scheme of things, the relative, uh, the relative contributions of these are likely to be quite low. Um, and typically, the, G, uh, the uh, granulate, uh, sorry, I should say the blast furnace slag that is stockpiled tends to be air-cooled and is not water-cooled, and it's water-cooled uh, slag that is used for, for granulation, of course, and it is the product that we use in our, uh, in our, in our cement and concrete. So a little, bit of, um, a little bit of material around, but again, nothing that's going to substantially change the overall global uh, availability from the information sources that we've, we've found. Again, this is an area particularly, I think, that we would welcome if anybody is aware of any other figures around this. I think if we can get a little bit more data to support this figure in terms of stockpiled uh, a stockpile clinker, that would be that would be very helpful. Sorry, um, stockpiled um, slag, I should say. So the summary from those figures, and you know, going back to those original figures about the global clinker uh, production and the global availability of GGS, is all telling us one thing: that the ratio of one to the other is in that range of about eight to twelve times more cement clinker being produced than there is global GGBS uh, production and availability. And we expect that ratio to stay pretty similar to that over the next six or seven years. And finally, from those stockpile figures that we have, we don't expect those stockpiles to be able to contribute significantly to changing that overall ratio. So that's really a, a summary of the, uh, the literature search that we've done that supports the numbers. Um, we will have a, a Q&A session afterwards, so if there's anything that's coming to mind by way of those figures, please hold that thought, and uh, you can ask us those questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So at this point, I will be handing over to uh, Paul, who will talk us through the overall resources and how that translates into global uh, GHG emissions. Paul. Thanks, Mike. Good to be here. Um, just so you know, I don't consider myself an expert, I'm more of an enthusiast. So I hope all of you are also lower carbon enthusiasts as well. So we've heard about this literature review and the different numbers that we have. So what does that really mean? Now, I just want to talk about the implications of the findings in terms of resources and limited resources and abundant resources. I know you're all very clever people, so this is probably obvious. But an important point here is just the consideration of the system boundary when we're considering decarbonisation in any material, actually. Obviously, we're trying to tackle climate change. It's global warming. Therefore, we have to be aware of our global system boundary. And at a global level, when you have a limited resource, as we have demonstrated in terms of its relative availability compared to clinker, then it doesn't matter where you use it, it's not going to fundamentally change the amount of that material available at a global level. When we then move some of that material into one project, which might be here, obviously that project could look fantastic and it is indeed lower carbon, but fundamentally we haven't addressed global emissions. And that's really the point we're trying to get across here, that whilst we can move this material around, we've got to try and reduce overall emissions. Now, 
as I say, this is not exclusive to GGBS. This is a problem across other materials as well. And we're not expecting people to do a global LCA when they look at um, a given project. But what we do have to be aware of, where we have these limited materials, we've got to have that global awareness of what that means, as well as looking at our own project. As Mike has said, fundamentally, that ratio is, is now, it, it is going to vary a little bit over the years. There'll be a bit more GGBS, GGBS available, there'll be a bit more cement, but the ratio doesn't significantly change. And that's a really important point to take away. Um, that, you know, we can't really increase that ratio. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't be using GGBS. We absolutely should be using every single kilogram of GGBS that we can. But it really comes down to how we use it, making sure that we get the maximum value. And by value, I mean the best ability to displace carbon from every kilogram that we have. The approach here as well is about recognizing where to use GGBS. It's been used for decades because of its really fantastic properties. It's a really good material. It's a fantastic SCM. And the main use of it historically was because it's fantastic for durability. That's a really important technical use that needs to be maintained and arguably prioritized. In addition, we know it's very good because it reduces the early heat generation of a given concrete, particularly a mass concrete element. So again, these are uses that should be prioritized in our view when we're considering this, this, this limited material. That's not to say we shouldn't use it though where we can. And this is when it does get a little bit tricky. What we're saying here is that if GGBS is available on a given project supply chain and it's considered to be appropriate to use it for a non-technical use, then by all means use it. But it has to be used efficiently. There is a, a reduced marginal gain of GGBS as you increase the amount you use. So at a certain point, a kilogram of GGBS is no longer as effective as a displacement of carbon than it might be somewhere else. That balance is going to be different for different concretes, for different projects. And so it's really important to have those conversations with the supply chain, a given supplier, and understand what can be achieved. But we definitely should use every single kilogram that we can, whenever we can. We did have a lot of debates, and it was a, quite a challenging debate about how to address perhaps some more firm guidance, maybe some more specific limits. But frankly, that's a very difficult thing to do right now because of all the variability. But we do recommend strongly that be looked at uh, in future work. Now, these recommendations are not limited to conventional concrete that uses GGBS. As far as we're concerned here, we've been doing a study on the material GGBS, not how it's used. And therefore, these findings are applicable to any technology which uses GGBS in this way. So in this situation, we would say they're applicable to AACMs as any other material as well. That's not to prejudice them, it's just we're looking at GGBS, not how it's being used. Um, another point to add, which is a bit more interesting, I would say, and there may be some questions about later, is the carbon allocation of GGBS. So all of this paper, all of this debate actually is predicated on the assumption that GGBS is a very low carbon material. And indeed, at the moment, if you get an EPD in general, it's around 80 kilograms per tonne. So it's around eight to nine times lower than Portland cement. However, due to the way that we assign carbon to GGBS, and because its value has increased significantly, its financial value, there is now a probable change to how carbon is allocated to GGBS. And that means that the carbon factor that you will get in future EPDs could be around double what it is at the moment. Uh, that's not confirmed, there's still work going on, but it's, it is probably going to increase as a result of that, which just adds more confusion, I recognize, but it's also a reason why all of this debate GGBS is not the only answer to decarbonisation. It needs to be decoupled from decarbonisation. When we're looking to have lower carbon concretes, we shouldn't be specifying a specific amount of GGBS. We should be specifying a carbon level and finding any way we can to deliver that. And of course, GGBS is one way, but there are many others that Nushin's going to tell you about in a minute. 
And just to, to wrap up, uh, other SCMs haven't been considered here. We are aware that obviously there are other important uh, SCMs and that's perhaps scope for future work as well. But we could only do one thing at a time and I'm not sure we could handle any more uh, debates. But uh, hopefully when we're replenished, we can tackle another one. Or indeed any of you can also contribute as well. So that's the end of that section. I'm going to hand over to Nushin, who will talk about reducing concrete emissions in other ways. Thanks, Paul. Um, so I think uh, in the paper, there are three questions that you can see. It just makes it a bit easier, probably, how to face this question of GGBS. And, uh, and I'm going to very briefly explain about these questions and how we can kind of respond to those. So the first one is, do we really need to use GGBS for technical reasons? And that is what Paul also mentioned. And it's really important if you really need it to use for technical reasons like marine structures and um, any other sort of durability, sulfate attack, uh, aggressive ground. So you should use it. Having said that, um, the paper has a global aspiration so um, there might be other SCMs, other supplementary cementitious materials available at the local, uh, at any local area that can have same sort of performance, requ uh, performance can kind of satisfy the durability requirements. So it's important to look at anything that is available locally and can satisfy those technical requirements as well. Uh, we had this question of, so, what percentage of concrete or GGBS that we are using is being used for technical purposes? Unfortunately, we, we were not able to find the answer. So um, at the moment, uh, we didn't have any sort of measurements or benchmark in place to say exactly what volume of GGBS is being used for technical uses. So therefore, there might be something left to be used just for low carbon purposes. So uh, the question is uh, then, is there any well-established supply chain in the place that can supply that GGBS? And as Paul also explained, is, is about the, having that conversation with your supplier and see what we can, you can achieve if you want to use GGBS and not just assuming certain percentage of GGBS for everything. And uh, the, normally at the ready mix production, for example, they, they have in the UK a certain silos for GGBS and cement. So they might be able to supply um, reasonably. <clears throat> then uh, actually this, this question might come very early in your project uh, before even asking about question of GGBS. What are the other ways that we can reduce emissions? Um, I, I've been informed that um, nobody wants to use a lot of cement because it's expensive. None of the suppliers really like to use a lot of cement. But um, th there are occasions happens that the cement can go higher than what has been specified. So maybe putting some clinker limits can be useful. Uh, then aggregate grading can help to have an optimized mix um, or uh, relaxing requirements for early strengths. So which I will explain a little bit more, or you, proper use of admixtures. Um, at MPA, we have a guide, a specified sustainable concrete guide, which you might find useful if you have a look at it for uh, your specifications. So um, about 56 day strengths, um, how it can be useful. Um, just a reminder that we always use 28 days strength, but it's, it's not something really scientific about 28 days. It's just a sort of conventional agreement, these 28 days. And um, all concrete increases strength after 28 days anyway. But the rate of these strength gains before 28 days and after 28 days can be different for different cement types. And this is not just about GGBS as well. It's, other cement, uh, supplementary cementitious materials can be the same. So whenever we want to use SCMs for uh, replacing clinker, we shouldn't assume that we can have the same sort of behaviors and performance and requirements as we had with SEM1. 
One of the considerations can be specifying 56 day strengths instead of 28 days. And that can help to uh, reduce the amount of the total binder because if you want to achieve the same sort of strengths at 28 days or earlier, three days or seven days with GGPS, then you would need to use more binder, which doesn't really result at a lower carbon solution. So if you look at the longer term strengths and specify longer term strengths, probably have impact on the program of construction, but eventually will really result in a lower carbon solution. Then, um, as a structural engineers, my colleagues have done a lot of research and uh, have produced guides about how other ways you can consider to reduce uh, emissions, looking at the spans, looking at the um, kind of basement, depths, beams, and everything else. And, and I just hear just one example uh, from the guide that we have at MPA. So if you change from flat slab to a two-way slab, uh, for a 10 meter span, you can probably save 32% of carbon. So again, it's, it's about asking question of what I can do before just assuming that everything can be resolved with GGBS. And then finally, an opportunity that is coming up within BS8500, the standard is being updated and uh, it will be published in November and it will give an uh, opportunity to use a uh, multi-component cement. So we know uh, in the past we could use two binders, like SEM1 with another binder, like GGPS or fly ash. Now the standard will give us the opportunity to use something like limestone with GGPS and SEM1. And as you can see, this graph is just showing the equivalent performance that we can achieve. And uh, eventually we can kind of use the GGBS more if efficiently uh, for reducing carbon when we combine it with limestone. Um, so th this is a really good opportunity to consider in the specifications going forward. And that's it from me. I'll pass it to Will. Thanks, Nisha. Um, could we start with a round of applause for our three speakers, please? Thank you. Um, I mean, there, there's, there's some conclusions on the screen which are the same as the six key messages in the executive summary at the front of the report. So hopefully you've sort of seen them before. But just to sort of run through them very briefly, you know, the, the, hopefully the key message that you've heard this evening is that, you know, GGBS does have a place and a use in construction. It has a use in concrete technologies, and we need to make sure we use all of it because if we don't, we're going to be using excessive amounts of clinker globally, and that would be a bad thing. But fundamentally, our research has demonstrated to us that as far as we can tell, it's limited, it's globally constrained, and therefore, if you ask for more of it in one location, all that's happening is we're moving it around. So if you think back to the diagram that Paul showed, you end up with more of this you know, low-carbon stuff on your project, somebody else must end up with more. Um, there are many other ways we just saw from Lucian to reduce the carbon emissions of our concrete designs, everything from concrete efficiency through to clinker efficiency. There's other SCMs. There's updates to the standards coming soon to support all of that. So there's lots of other things we can do. Um, and, of course, we should still be using GGBS when we then still need it, even after we've done all those things. So if we need it technically, it should, of course, be specified. Um, and if we're going to use it beyond those requirements, we need to be doing so from well-established supply chains. Um, and we need to be using it in proportions cognizant of everything that you've just heard in the presentation and everything that's in the paper. Um, I think the, the key point for me is that, is that last point, right? This paper doesn't tell you specifically what you need to do on every project. It deliberately stays away from that. You need to have conversations with your clients, with your collaborators about how you're going to approach your projects. You need to speak to your supply chain about what's available. Um, but hopefully now you feel you can sort of do all of that in the context of this information, which hopefully should help you with all of that. Um, for anyone who wants it, I will leave this QR code up briefly whilst the speakers come up. This will take you to the web page where you can download the PDF and you can share it with colleagues and so on. Um, to be honest, if you just Google it, it comes up pretty quickly. GDBS I struck T. It should be at the top of Google. Um, and so now we'll move on to Q&A. So could I ask Mike, Paul and Lucian to please take a seat um, up at the front? And like I said at the start, we've got questions online as well as 
in the room. Um, I'll probably start with see if there's any questions in the room. And if we're all feeling a bit shy, then we'll jump to our online audience first. So if there are questions in the room, please put your hand up. Um, we've got a couple of microphones, so please wait for the microphone to get to you. Otherwise, people online have no idea what you said. And I have to try and repeat it, and I'll get it wrong. So do we have any questions from anyone in the room first? Uh, yeah, gentlemen down the front. Just wait for the microphone, thanks. <coughs> Thank, thank you. Um, thanks for the, the talk today. Um, I, I'm working on a startup which is bringing a slightly different SEM to market. And forgive me, this isn't just about GGBS specifically, and I know that's what the presentation was about. Um, but it's got microsilica and, and magnesium carbonate in the, in the form of capture CO2. Um, I know that microsilica is regarded as a SEM, which is somewhat established, but is not used as widely. Um, is it? Is it that GGBS is just well more established than, or is it the cost constraints? What, what are the kind of things that have held that back in the past, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, Nushan, go for it, please. Uh, well, as far as I know, there are actually other my colleagues that might know better than me. Uh, but um, generally, I think you can use silica about 10% to 15% as much as, I know, as far as I know. And um, it's, it's a sort of a, a bit fast setting uh, properties. So it, it's very different from GGBS in a sense. Uh, it has fantastic properties in terms of um, kind of the microstructure of concrete, fin uh, like final product. Uh, but um, when you look at the carbon reduction and durability requirements and working with GGBS, I think it's been kind of uh, very typical to use it because of like you can use higher percentage replacements for clinker. You can use it for, as Paul mentioned, for uh, sort of reducing the heat of hydration, which is exactly opposite of silica fume. So uh, obviously very uh, useful SCM, uh, but um, different applications, I would say. And um, and I'm not sure about availability of silica fume. How much actually? I, if any of my colleagues want to help. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? Oh, yep, yeah, down the front, Claire. Uh, it's down at the front, Zoe. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Um, this is potentially too nerdy, but at the start, when you have your references, I noticed they're all from the last few years, which makes sense as a current question. But given the economic downturn during the pandemic that shall not be named, um, is that accounted for in those numbers at all? Do we think that that actually had an impact? Because presumably, sort of plants were closed and not generating stuff, um, or not. Does that make sense? Is, is that data going to be representative going forward, given that the last few years have not been typical of the last decade, say? Mm. Do we think the numbers would be different if we would looked at it four years ago? Mm. Um, I, no, I think it's, uh, it's, fine. it's working. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a, it's a very good question. I mean, and, and yeah, to answer one, one point is that, yes, we did deliberately take kind of more recent data uh, because we felt it did have a bit more validity. There was nothing that, that, that from that data that indicated that those were not representative of what was, what was happening globally, I would say. And again, I think the important thing is, is in, in all of this is that it's the order of magnitude between the clinker production and the, uh, uh, and the slag production. And as you can see, there's a bit of variability. You know, we had a range of about times eight to times 12. And even if there was some variation, we don't believe that that overall ratio is going to change fundamentally. If I can just come in on that as well. So one of my colleagues produced a paper a few months ago in the structural engineer as well which sets up the history of GGBS consumption and use in production. So, um, and I don't think it's significant, um, really. So, but, but by all means, have a look and see. Thanks. Um, we'll go for a couple of questions online, and I'll probably throw the first one at Paul, if that's okay. So, um, Charlie Law asks, uh, latest version of the RICS professional statement on whole life carbon assessment suggests 25% cement replacement should be targeted. And I'll add to Charlie's point that the current ice truck tea guide has calculated body carbon also suggests 25%. Um, but you seem to be saying that there's only enough GGBS for around 10% replacement. Should the RICS PS be amended to 10%? Um, well, I was also involved in that document, I should add, and there's also been some difficult decisions on that. Um, that says cement replacement, not GGBS, um, importantly. And so it is more of a generalised proposal, and it's also to be used 
in the absence of other information. So wherever possible, people should use the actual concrete that they have, the carbon data they have. But what we're saying in, in, the, in the RIGS guide is that in the absence of that, 25% cement replacement is a sort of average position that would give you the appropriate carbon value to use in an LCA before you get more information. Uh, we're not saying here that you know all GDBS should be used at 10% in concrete. We're, we're saying that that is the global average, but there will be obviously be variances and depending on supply chains and other requirements. So you know, I think it's important to make that clear. We're not saying yeah. that here. Um, it's it's more general in the in the RICS guide really. If I could add it as well, that, I mean the other thing to note about the RICS guide and the ISOT guide is that the percentage that it gives is a sort of um, it's what you would expect to receive on on a site in the UK on average. So it's based on how much cement replacement's been used in the UK on average over the past couple of decades or so. Um, knowing this data doesn't change that, right? So we would assume that on a typical, and obviously because it's there's a range, nothing's ever typical, but on average across all projects, we will go on receiving about 25% on our sites in the UK. And therefore, if you're doing an early stage um, whole life carbon assessment and you're looking at different options, it would make sense to use that figure. And that's why that's there. And um, that's different to what's, you know, what we're saying is available globally. Yeah. New? Sure. Also, yes, go on, Nusha, then, I just Mike. wanted to add something yeah, yeah, as please. well. I think with multi-component cement coming to the standard as well. So the standard is allowing up to 20% re replacement just with limestone. And, uh, well, I think typically, like, even 10%, 15% will be a typical replacement that will happen. So and you can top it up with other SCMs. So yep. there's a lot of opportunity to achieve that 25%. And, that, and that's coming at the end of this year, is that right? Uh, probably November, I guess. November? Yeah. Mike, do you yeah, want to? Uh, I was going to add as well, you know, and you know, this paper doesn't indicate that, you know, there's an immediate sort of bust in terms of the availability of GGBS in the UK or anywhere else at the moment. It's just that if we look at it on a global basis, we know that the ratios don't add up. So at the moment, there are certain countries that tend to use GGBS as a bit of a go-to solution for decarbonizing concrete. So we've got you know, a demand for those technical reasons that were, that were outlined. And then we've got a demand because people are saying, yes, we want to decarbonize our, our, our structures. So that's utilizing this GGBS. Now that's fine, whereas what, while there's only a few countries like the UK and one or two others going to that go-to solution. But when the sort of, the, you know, other countries may have that light bulb moment and say, actually, we've got to now get serious about decarbonizing our structures and we're going to use our own GGBS. That's when the problem will really start to arise. And the question is, and it's a bit of a, you know, um, uh, an open question, you know, it'll, you know, we don't know when that point will, will, will happen. But what we can see is that in some of those countries where the, um, the, the emissions from their actual, their own clinker manufacturer may be higher emitting than UK manufacturing processes. We're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul ultimately at some point. So we've got to look at how we can actually look at alternatives to using GGBS. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's what we're, but that's what really we're trying to, I would say that um, we're, we're trying to get that conversation uh, going. Yeah. Or if you are using GGBS, just look at how efficiently you need to use it. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, that one of the hopes of getting this paper out is that it helps incentivize interest in all the other things we can do um, and other cement replacements and so on. Um, I'm going to ask another question that's coming online just because it's very closely related and I feel like it's sort of worth asking. Should, and I don't know who's going to answer this first, so maybe you can all think about it. Should we be using a generic average carbon factor for cement that accounts for the national percentage of available GDBS, which would push designers to minimize material use, look to abundant SEMs, and avoid anomalies of projects local to blast furnace steel plants who are looking for low carbon due to a local abundance of GDBS. What do you think, Paul? Do you want to go first again? Yeah, I think the answer to that is no, because um, that I think would stifle innovation in the sector. I think you know we 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 first of all should always be looking to use less materials, but that that should be a separate metric in my view. Um, then the carbon intensity of the materials that you do use, we should be trying to drive down as much as we possibly can. I think if we were to use a standard factor, that would undermine new technologies that might be lower. So we want to encourage that, that innovation, that development, and people to optimize. Um, but we also want to encourage optimal material use. They go together, but I don't think there's one mechanism to solve them together. 
Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other questions in the room? Oh, we got one in the back, I think. It's very bright standing it on here. So apologies. Uh, um, to build on one of the piece points about, uh, was it Mike said about if all the other countries start have a light bulb moment and want to use GGBS, and then what do we do? Isn't that exactly what we want to happen as soon as possible? Uh, because then the price goes up, the startups in the room have their business case made for the alternative SCMs, and, and all of a sudden, the, it, you know, the free market will drive innovation for us. So, a question on free market: Should we leave it to the free market? If everyone else tries to buy us, it will go up in price to the point where no one can afford us anyway. <laughs> yeah, you always do, Pete. <laughs> Mike? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, why, why not? Maybe we should be encouraging them to have that light bulb moment sooner than later then, um, you know. Um, but, uh, but um, yeah, one, again, I think, you know, in, in, over the last few months or a year, as Will said that we've been thinking about this paper, I think, you know, we did talk about whether, you know, it, the, you know the market will dictate this through, through, through cost. And yes, you know, that, that moment may, may come. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I don't think we should necessarily wait for it. You know, I, I think there's a, it's sort of incumbent on us as a profession to try and drive change a little bit more quickly by asking our suppliers, you know, creating that demand signal that we do want um, alternatives. Well, it's also financially sensible yeah. not to wait until you have yeah. to pay a lot of money yeah. for the thing that you've just locked a supply chain into, right? So as we all saw when we were getting material shortages, that hits you hardest if you've already agreed to buy certain amounts of something much better for the UK to invest and get interested now in alternatives to this, get very good at reducing carbon without relying on this single globally constrained product and get ahead of the game rather than waiting for it to simply go up in cost and then be looking for alternative solutions. Yeah, which no, again absolutely. was the, kind of one of the drivers of doing this paper was yeah. to try and head off anything like that because we think it makes sense to just act now. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Just to you know, build on Will's point, you know, I don't think we want to be in a situation where we're reaching that, that, that cliff edge and there's a great opportunity here to, to, to pro, you know, promote uh, innovation. Um, so it's good to, 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 to know that there's a, a few uh, innovators here in, in, in the room. I think you know, there's a great opportunity for you. Can I ask you something? Sure. I think, um, yeah, obviously, we, we don't know what will happen exactly in other countries and what will they decide to do. And another part of it is uh, a lot of places in the world, they, they don't even use any other supplementary materials and they are relying on someone. So it, it's a big change to include it all in the standards and the specifications and learn how to work with that. These are all gonna happen. But it might be that they choose another SCM. We don't know exactly how it will work out, but we know that GGBS is, is being used most of it. So uh, that's the reality we're seeing. So, Nushin, a bit of a follow-on question online. Um, how do you define whether or not the supply chain is well-established? Um, doesn't the demand drive the establishment of the supply chain, which would therefore continue to concentrate use in the global north? Do you want to try and answer that? That's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think we tried so hard to kind of define this well-established or local. It's, it's obviously a very complicated question. But uh, I think... Is supply chain established in the UK because we have all the standards in place, we have the specifications, we know how to use it, so there is all established, so there is certain amount of GGBS available and it's good if we can use that certain amount that is available. Um, so we can't just like ignore that is already there and established, so we need to look at what we can use. But It might almost be easier to define not well established. Because if yes. you're in a situation where you're asking for GDBS and the contractor's really scratching their heads trying to get hold of it, that would indicate that it's not a well-established supply chain. So maybe, maybe that's, a, that's an easier way to come in. I'm not sure. That's not a position that's been agreed amongst the authors. I should have said, I've just thrown that out there as a thought. Um, I, think, I, say, I think the most important thing, though, is to have those conversations with suppliers yeah. because that doesn't yeah. happen enough. Yeah. People make specifications independent of, of those discussions at all. And we need people to talk to suppliers and find out what's available because it will vary. Okay, probably not so much in London, but outside of London, it will vary. And we need people to recognise that there's different options in different places. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. A um, couple more questions in the room down the front, Gigi. That's okay. Yeah. 
sit outside of 8500. So where do you see that going for the future in terms of ACM for the use of GTPS for the future in terms of specifying it and looking at specific technical applications? That's a Paul or Nushin question, isn't um, it? <laughs> I'll start and then you can correct me. Um, well, it's a really good question, of course. Um, there is a project going on now to develop a flex standard, which will not fully resolve that, but will definitely make it easier for AACMs as well as other technologies to be brought to market in a way that demonstrates their compliance and compatibility with, with other standards. So I think there are avenues that can be pursued to continue to use those new materials and to encourage other new materials to be developed. Um, and that ought to allow that to happen and continue. So um, that probably doesn't quite answer it, but there is there is a potential f route in the future, I think, for, the, for that to, to continue and be brought to market. Good. <laughs> right, we had another question at the back in the room. Um, Gigi, you mind? Thanks. Uh, a couple of hours further. Um, hi, sorry, just kind of, I got two questions. First question was kind of on the back of everything else. Do we know as a global percentage how much GGBS or we, as a nation we are currently using? So of the 400 megatons, do we have a concept on how much the UK as a very small country is actually using? Kind of question one. Um, we do, I can't remember the numbers. Um, it's in that paper that I mentioned earlier on as well. I can't remember yeah, the numbers. Yeah, in the ISRT paper. It's a few months ago, but there's, there's a whole detailed uh, UK use of GDBS in there. The, so one, the one thing I can remember from that paper is that we import about half of the GDBS we use in the UK, roughly. So about half of it comes from our own blast furnaces in the UK, and the other half gets imported. Um, but I can't remember the numbers. If you come and grab me afterwards, I'll give you the link to the paper we mentioned so you can read up on it. Okay, thanks. And sorry, then question two is we talked about we talked about other mixtures and I see London Concrete recently have done a kind of a showcase of their calcine clear additive, which is worse, for a better word, for embodied carbon, but it's readily available and it's there and we can specify it. But how, as a someone, as a con from a con I work for a contractor, trying to encourage clients, how can we encourage something that has got less precedence? You all want to talk about novel materials? Or could I go first? I mean, the first point I'd make, of course, is that, again, one of the sort of reasons for this paper is hopefully to help you, help your clients understand that there's a need for these other things, such as cloud sign clay. So there's less precedent, sure. But anything that's not GDBS or PFA, generally speaking, isn't as well known about in the industry right now in the UK. Um, but we need other solutions. So we need things like cloud sign clays to enter the market over here. Um, and the hope is that this paper makes that a bit more obvious so you can at least start to have that conversation. As to what you do about the use of that novel material, I'm going to hand over to Mike. Yeah, I'm just going to make a, a, one Great. point as well about that. You know, at, at the end of the day, you know, what we're looking for is, a, is a, a trajectory of reduction, if you like. And I think in, in that regard, it's worth thinking about you know, the, the concrete zero commitment, which is, you know, has progressive targets to which we've got to re, you know, that we, we should be aiming for to get to, to net zero. Um, in, in, our, in our concrete use. So if, if calcine clay cement doesn't reach the same carbon reductions as using GGBS, but is helping us on that trajectory, there's a very important place for it. You know, and, and this is the thing, I think we've got to look at a, a sort of a basket of opportunities. There's no one go-to solution. They all will contribute to, to decarbonization of our concrete. Yeah, exactly, as Mike said, there is no such one solution. And I think, uh, as MPA, we are also doing another project for reclaimed calcine clay, uh, looking at sort of demolition <clears throat> materials and what clay comes out of it. Uh, but but th there's a lot of work around, around calcine clay, and sooner or later, they will come to the market. It just needs that sort of uh, establishing the supply chain. <laughs> if I can just add as well, I think this goes back to the system boundary. So. On the assumption that all GGBS is used uh, for using GGBS in your project doesn't reduce global emissions necessarily, using calcine clay probably does at a global level. So your project may not look amazing, but actually, because you're displacing Portland cement that would have otherwise been used, arguably you are reducing global emissions. And I recognise that's difficult to explain and sell, so to speak, but you know that, that's, the, that's the situation we're in because calcine clay is, is comparatively abundant. Same, same with limestone. We've been having the same conversations on scrap in steel 
and so I think this topic, this topic of my project's emissions and the global emissions are two different system boundaries and we need to bear them both in mind, I think will become more and more mainstream over the years and clients will have to start thinking about global implications, not just emissions due to everything within their red line and closer is to the rest. So I think it will get easier over time, but for sure it's a new conversation to be having at the moment with a lot of clients. Do you have other questions in the room? Hi. Uh, just on the back of that, I was curious to know more about the, the carbon factor for DGBS increasing and almost by twofold uh, based on its economic value. Could you explain that a bit more on, on why that is and uh, how, how that works? Uh, I'm going to just delegate that to Anushin for a minute. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. So, um, so I, I think at the European level, as far as I know, I, I'm not deep in this conversation. Um, so there is conversations going on between steel industry and concrete industry, and there should be an agreement about the methodology of kind of um, allocating that um, carbon to concrete. Um, and EN 15804, uh, which is the EPD standard, it has the methodology in place, uh, so it could be used, um, but it's taking long to get that agreement. But at UK, um, I think my colleagues uh, the, at UK Concrete, um, they, are, they have um, decided to update the fact sheet 18 we have, which has all the carbon values for uh, materials. They will update it with an allocation value soon. Um, and this will be based on different EPDs that they will have in hand. Right there. Does that answer the question? Okay, great, thanks. Um, I have um, a question for Paul. Um, I think you mentioned uh, that you think uh, in a given mix for specification there should be a um, target for carbon and that GGBS would be part of the solution for that. If you have a mix and then you pass that to the supply chain, the contractor supplier, isn't there a sort of risk that they might just look to achieve that target by increasing the specification of GGBS? There is, definitely. Um, I think the point is, first of all, though, to, to not start with a specific GGBS replacement rate. So trying to provide flexibility in the specification, but setting a carbon target and ideally having a conversation with them. And I recognize you're absolutely right. You know, at the moment, you go to suppliers, they may not have many alternatives. But as we've just heard, you know, companies are bringing new products to market. It's, you know, it's starting to happen. And so in that situation, they could say, well, look, we can't meet your target unless we use GGBS. We could use the calcine clay concrete we've developed, which may not be exactly the same target, but is a new material. And then we can have a conversation. But I think we have to have those conversations. If we, if we keep the process entirely linear where we do a specification, send it off, and then it gets built, then we're just not going to really develop any you know, trust or engagement on how to tackle this problem. So I think it has to be a two-way conversation. And I think, you know, in the coming years, I would like to think we'll have more options available. We're going to have some multi-component cements, which are really exciting in the context of concrete. Um, you know, <laughs> and I'm sure we'll have other things as well. And then we can have those conversations. So there is a risk, but that's why we need to talk. I think that, that point about conversation with the supply chain is really important. And actually, I've been told a few stories in the past couple of years of people who have specified a whole load of GDBS in their spec and put it out the door and it's gone to the concrete supply chain. And because they were assuming they were going to get it, the, the concrete design hasn't, maybe it hasn't been as efficient as it could have been because they think that to meet the carbon targets they've set, they can achieve it through this spec. And then what's happened is that the supply chain's turned around and said, well, we can't procure that right now. This is how much it will cost or we can't get hold of it. And then you end up in this situation where the design was using, you know, arguably too much concrete in the first place because they thought this sort of solved this through clever specification of GDBS. And you end up with a much higher carbon concrete frame at the end of it because you just end up with a 20% you know, mix or 30% mix, whatever would be more normal. So I think that, that bit about speaking to the supply chain um, has harmed people in the past to not doing it. And we just need to learn to get better at this on every project. Yeah, I would think, you know, if, if there was going to be one, you know, if I was going to distill it down, that one, one takeaway, I, I don't want it to be one takeaway, but if there was one, it's, I, it's having that early conversation. The number of times, you know, I've been involved in conversations, going to concrete suppliers, sort of, if, you know, if only you'd come and spoken to us, you know, a couple of weeks before or whatever, we might have been able to do something different. Um, so don't underestimate that, uh, in, you know, the importance of that call. And I think there's a few concrete suppliers in the room here, and I'm, I'm sure they would um, 
uh, and endorse that, uh, that, 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 that comment. So yeah, definitely have, um, you know, have, have, have those conversations. I know sometimes the work that we do might be a little bit more reactive. I'm, you know, the industry I'm, I'm, or the company I'm working for does a lot of reactive work. We don't always have that luxury. Um, but certainly, you know, if, we, if we're talking about the big structures, you know, big infrastructure buildings, there should be plenty of time to have those conversations. Yeah, just that as well. So one of the things was that if we focus only on the cement type, we're missing a big lever, which is cement content as well. And that's another opportunity to optimize and reduce carbon. And I've had conversations with suppliers where we felt the cement content was a bit too high. I thought they were going to shout at me, but thankfully they, they didn't, and they just reduced it by 30 kilograms using a bit more um, plasticizer. So it was a 30 kilogram saving in cement from you know a phone call, and that, you know that's not changing anything. It's not new risk. It's just a, having a conversation. So I would, you know just to echo the point, I would really say have those conversations. Look at cement blends as well as cement content, and also the aggregate sizing. You know, it's the whole concrete needs to be considered to get it as low as possible. I think as well on early conversations, we should also mention the benefits of having an early conversation about this with the client. Um, you know, four years ago, I'm pretty sure none of us were being asked by our clients how much GDBS we were going to use. I mean, most of them had never heard of the stuff, right? Let's be honest. Whereas actually, I mean, having a conversation at the start of a project about the level of ambition for the spec how we're going to go about achieving a low carbon concrete, what we're going to do with regards to GDBS, what we're going to do in consideration of this information. That's really key because that means we don't get stuck in a corner where the client thinks we're going to deliver something that can only be delivered with a very high percentage of GDBS that then backs us into that corner. Instead, we've got sort of cards on the table at the start and we then say, right, how do we design with what we've got? And it gives you, know, gives, gives you freedom to do some of these other things we've just discussed later on. Um, Sorry, can I also add something? <clears throat> it, it's a little bit out of the scope of this paper, but uh, Low Carbon Concrete Group, um, they uh, published the be benchmark, market benchmark recently. Um, that is a good basis for conversation. So basically you can look at uh, what concrete you want to use and see what range of sort of carbon is available and what's the average that can be achieved. And then... Um, Maybe you can go to the supplier and see how can I go from a C concrete to a B concrete and how we can optimize that mix. That it seems there is a possibility to go uh, and change that level of carbon. So that benchmark that is going to be updated regularly uh, can be a point of conversation to be used as the basis of conversation, yeah. basically. But, yeah. Um, could we take a couple of quick fire questions online? Because I'm conscious of how many people are out there, wherever they are. Um, so the first one, I think, hopefully, is quite easy to answer. For clarity, is GDBS only used in cement, or as a cement replacement, or is it used for any other products? Nushin, do you want to? Um, GGBS, I'm not sure if it's being used in other products, but slag, still a slag is being used yeah. for many different slag, things. Slag is, but once it's been ground and granulated, no, granulated and ground, I'm it's only used sure. as an SCM typically, yeah, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've got a question on stockpile data, uh, which I would reiterate, by the way, if you have data on stockpiles, do please get in touch because it is an area that we, we struggled with, um, actually. And we had a few people sort of tell us anecdotally, oh, there's, there must be more than that. Um, and we're never able to follow through with any numbers. So if you have numbers, please send them our way. We'd love to see them. Um, and, that, and I mean that in the UK and international sense, of course. Um, a question on stockpiles. Um, did the authors get in contact with some of the major concrete suppliers, e.g. Tarmac, who used to have some stockpiles in Wales, which they use for GDBS supply? So would anyone like to just touch briefly on who we did speak to about stockpiles? Because I don't remember speaking to Tarmac. Don't call Tarmac. No. So Andrew, if you're still listening and you're able to put us in contact with them, please, please do. That would be great. Um, and then last question online before we go back to the view, maybe. Just a question on stockpiles, just a more generic point on stockpiles, not that particular thing. But again, we've got to remember, if, um, if somebody is going to, first of all, uh, granulate um, their, their slag, which means a, a water cooling, and then grind it, it's going to go into a silo and it's going to be used. In, in, in concrete. Nobody's going to do that and just dump it somewhere. So you're not going to found, find a ground granulated glass, glass finish slag anywhere as a, 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 as a stockpile. What, you, what you're more likely to find is uh, air-cooled slag 
right? Because that tends to just come off the from the uh, uh, the, the steel making or well, the iron making process and, and and dumped as air cooled slag. So that's not a granulated uh, slag. Um, the the missing part, the, the the numbers really is: is there any granu uh, Is there any um, sorry? If there any ground, um, uh, is there any granulated slag that's out there in stockpiles? And then if there is, can you many years later granulate it and get the same performance as you would from a a, a ground granulated blast in a slag? Now. It, it, it reduces its activity um, when, when it's when it's left outside, so it won't perform the same. But um, there is actually a, a bit, a, 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 I think, a, a, a potential technology that may or may not help that, which is uh, a thing called energetically mo energetic modification, uh, which has been trialled by a particular company, which uses a rotating uh, ball mill um, and, and grinding technology that reactivates. Uh, materials and has been tried on things like volcanic ashes, uh, so natural pozzolans. Now, whether something like that could be used on a granulated um, uh, 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 blast furnace slag that's been tipped somewhere and has been lying there for many years, I don't know the answer to. But maybe maybe somebody can uh, do that do that research, and that may result in uh, in another material uh, becoming available. Yeah. So, in short, if there are stockpiles, we'd like to know. Yes. And yeah. there might be things people can do yeah. with them. Um, Sorry, Bill, I think um, Mikal, one of the authors, one uh, was a student at Leeds, they are doing some study as well on stockpile, and they were showing there are yeah. stockpiles, but we are not sure if they are yeah. Yeah. granulates yeah. or not. A um, couple of other quick ones then. So, uh, well, one's not a question. So the author of the paper that we mentioned about UK supply has been in touch to say that 2 million tonnes per year is the usage in the UK, of which 50% is imported. I can see nodding from somebody who clearly knows that's true, so that's good. Um, so last quick question on lime before we go back into the room. How does the use of limestone compare with GDBS commercially? Does anyone have any feel for that? So obviously limestone coming in as a, as a part of a ternary blend at the end of the year, do we know how that, how that would compare? I would speculate it's, it's tiny compared to GDBS at the moment, yeah. but hopefully will we'll rapidly increase. But I mean, it's. You speculate that it would be very cheap compared to GDBS at the moment. Oh, cheap. Is that what the question was? Uh, how oh. does the use of limestone compare to GDBS commercially? Yeah, okay. Uh, I would also speculate that it's probably cheaper, but uh, <laughs> that's not, uh, probably not a, a wise thing to do. I'm sure there's people in the room who might know. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, sorry, I don't know the detail. No, okay. Well, I'm sure we'll find out in due course. Um, should we go back to questions in the room? Do we, gentlemen on the back? Thank you. Uh, going back to your question or the topic earlier about the REBA advising the sort of 25% level, I think what, what we're seeing in London in the London structures where we're using sort of anywhere between sort of 50 to 70% GGBS in the concrete mixes. Do you think we should, I mean at the moment I think it's looking at a positive if you can beat that 25% or percent replacement. Do you think we should actually be getting it into the REBA literature that we should be maximising at a certain percentage to make sure that we're, people are understanding what we should be doing correctly. So uh, I think it's, it's the RICS guide we're, we're, we're referring to earlier yeah. on. Um, I think this is, is a bit tricky, but that, the purpose of that document is, is guidance on whole life carbon assessment. It's not intended to be some kind of instrument to change how materials are used. It's not a design guide or a specification guide. No. Right? So I would suggest that things like this guide are the, are the industry pieces that should be used to make informed decisions about materials. That um, the RICS guide is about measuring carbon. It's low because we want people to use the EPDs wherever possible. Therefore, you're effectively kind of penalised by using a, a lazier number. So it's much better to use the more accurate data, which we would hope is better than 25%. And it's not GDBS, it's anything or any way of reducing it. So um, I don't think that's the right vehicle for any kind of industry guidance. You know, hopefully things like this, which may be complemented by other guides in the future, as well as all the other work that you know, Will and the abstract have been doing and the LCCG, uh, help to provide that guidance. Um, but I don't think it's the, in my opinion, it's the right thing for the, for the RICS guide. Sure, if you can wait for the microphone. <laughs> so I guess when buildings are getting the funding approved, lots of the funding is based on 
embodied carbon targets, and sorry, when I was referring to REBA, it's often based on hitting the REBA 2030 targets or around 30% below the REBA 30 targets, yeah. 2030 targets. So by the time the whole life carbon assessment is done for the point, for, at the point of gaining funding for the structure or for the development, I feel maybe it's too late, you know, it's already been sort of locked in and the developers now have got the funding based on those embodied carbon targets. So how do we get the message right at the beginning of the process of what we should be aiming for in terms of the embodied carbon and not just going to the simple answer of let's put 50 to 70% GGBS in the concrete? Do you mind if I start? So, I'd, I mean, clearly if a developer came to you and said, I want you to design me my structure for five kilograms of carbon per square metre, you'd, you'd start with a pretty big conversation about the achievability of that figure, right? So if your client, you know, potential client or architect, developer, whoever it is, comes to you to say, we've locked in a carbon target of X, and you go away and you do the numbers on this, and you think the only possible way to be able to deliver that is through the use of a constrained resource in this way. Um, so it's got to be a 70% GDBS mix across the board. Or if it's a steel frame, it's got to be 100% recycled steel from electric art furnaces, which has exactly the same problem. If that's the conclusion that leads you to, because the number they're asking for is so low, I think you have to go back to that client very quickly and explain to them what the problem is here. Um, the point of this paper is to enable you to, to do that, in effect, so you can go to them and say, look, the industry understanding is this, it's globally constrained, if we're asking for this much of it, it doesn't reduce global emissions, um, therefore it's all well and good you asking for this on a project level, um, but the only way we can do it is, is with the specification in this way, that doesn't help on a global level, as far as we know. Um, and so this is there so you can have that conversation early on. I mean, obviously we can't change everything on every project tomorrow just because we launched this paper today. Um, but I think the hope is that over time, clients will start to get wise to this. We, whilst we were developing this, I knew engineers who were saying to me that their clients were ringing them up on this topic already over the last year. And they didn't know the research was going on. So clients are open to talking about it. But yeah, I think it's, it's cumbersome on us as engineers to speak to them early on and say, what you're asking for isn't achievable within what you think you're trying to do. Does anyone want to add to that? I would just sort of add, and apologies, I think I understand now. Um, in that situation, I would suggest some degree of sensitivity analysis to consider what the what ifs. So, mm. you know, particularly if you've got a long-term project, you know, you know what's, what happens if GDBS, GDBS allocation changes, for example? What happens if cast iron clay comes on board and actually perhaps it drops down, what happens if limestone comes in, but what if those things don't happen as well? So I, I think that, you know, it would be, if possible, I recognise it's a bit of work, but to have a bit of a sensitivity analysis and understand the risks effectively on achieving a target and what's driving those risks and have that conversation with the client to explain because um, I think, you know, carbon assessments are treated often with a degree of certainty which is... Mm. Um, unwise, I would suggest, and actually, there's a lot of uncertainty in a lot of those numbers. So, we need to be communicating that a lot more. Um, do we have another question in the room? Uh, so, gentlemen at the back, Zoe, just in front of you, I'll put your hand up again so the microphone can find you. Oh, it's oh, gone somewhere else. We'll come back to you. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I've got two questions. One. The paper is kind of based on the assumption that all the GGBS and fly ash or oh, it's only GGBS, isn't it, but is used. Are we confident that it is all being used in the global market? Because we care in this country and we're relatively resourceful, but maybe other areas of the globe, not so much. So are we actually confident it is all being used? Is there enough demand for it? Probably yes. But in reality, is it being used or is it being uh, landfilled, scraped away, not used for carbon reduction? So that's the first question. Second question is complete opposite, and it's going back on that gentleman's argument about funding and carbon. I mean, the problem is, is that the REBA numbers are too low, and you can't hit 600 with a concrete building, I don't think, without serious innovation, impact program, and everything else. I just thought I'd throw that out there, because, yeah, those numbers are nigh on impossible, I think. Uh, so we'll take the second question as a comment. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah, well, sorry, question, but again, do you think, do you think you could actually use concrete to achieve that, and what would you use to do it? I'll, I'll phrase it as a question back to you, because I don't think low carbon concrete really 
exists, it's all a pretty impactful material. It's a brilliant material, that's why we use it in construction. But there's a big conflict because actually it's lower carbon than, you know, 100% pool and cement or whatever, but it's still pretty high overall as a carbon emission. Maybe I've just pushed the big elephant into the room, but... So, um, so there's a big conflict, right? Because people want the funding, people want this, but the reality is very different. So, so the, fir the first question is about how confident we are that all the GGBS that is created is used. Um, and the second question is about feasibility of achieving REBA targets using concrete frames. Does anybody want to go on the first one first? We should take yeah, them in order, I think. I'll, I'll start on the first one. Um, the figures that we had actually were utilization rates as well so the, the 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 sources of information that we looked at did actually say these were utilization rates so you know i guess you know we we, we have to take that on on, on face value uh, that those figures are are, are right we, we had i think two or if not three different utilization figures which were all roughly in the same sort of magnitude so that kind of gives us a, a, a reasonable amount of confidence but it was specifically utilization and it was around the 85 to 90 percent Mark, I think the other thing is that it has any. If you if you're going to invest in water quenching and granulating yeah. something, you're only going to do that if you can sell it. You're only going to be able to sell it if somebody will buy it, and they're only going to buy it if they're going to use it probably. Um, and all the projects I've done internationally, um, if anything, I've only ever seen the, the opposite problem, which is people not buying in enough things like concrete to try and um, things like cement to save money. Rather than yeah, I, d I don't think that. Chances are that there are people out there buying GGBS and then landfilling it. Personally, it wouldn't. I don't see what the economic benefits of doing that would be. So, see what I mean? when, when it's like so, so all of the research that we did, so the numbers in the paper indicate that out of all of the slag that's produced, over ninety percent of that is water quench and granulated, and then we assume that all of that gets used. Otherwise, you wouldn't do that to it in the first place. Does anybody want to touch on the second question? Oh, sure. Should, um, yeah. I think one of the things as MPA we were worried is an intended consequence of the paper that caused like sorts of GGBS not being used fully. <clears throat> and that's why the paper is not so definitive about the percentage and what you should do, because it's really important that we make sure um, GGBS is fully utilized because at at the end of the day is a byproduct, is a waste material before touching sort of natural resources, uh, like most of the clays that are natural resources. So that's why the actually it took so long and it's kind of was very, like wording was very sort of uh, difficult to put together to make sure that that unintended consequence basically doesn't happen and we, we keep utilizing UGBS as a full sort of utilization. Mm -hmm. So the question on um, can you design a concrete frame to meet the REBA um, carbon figures, I mean, Paul, within Ramble, there must be teams of people trying to do this. Have you had any experience of them and how they found it? Well, what I would say is you said a minute ago um, we can't achieve that without serious innovation. But, you know, that, that's the point, I think, right? <laughs> like the, we have to make these big changes. And I would add that we're not going to solve these problems through material decarbonisation alone. That's a really useful thing to happen. And of course, predominantly today, we're talking about the carbon intensity of concrete as a material. But there's many things we can and should be doing as designers, and they won't all go smoothly. I mean, some of them involve challenging the brief, challenging our clients and challenging ourselves as well as to what, when we solve these problems. So, um, I, you know, I don't think it's easy, but I think it's doable. And I think that we have to look very carefully at every single project and see how we can achieve that. And to answer your question, I don't have an immediate answer to a project. I'm sure there are. But, you know, we're looking at everything. And it's not, you know, we don't just say we're going to do a concrete frame. We look at all materials. You know, there's hybrid structures. I mean, I'm sure there's many of you in the room who've done all kinds of interesting approaches to try and bring down the average as well as reusing structures or reusing structural elements. There's a whole range of things that we need to do. But the innovation... Definitely, we, we need to do that. So, and there's, there's opportunities to do that as well. Mm. Um, so it is a target, but if it wasn't hard, it wouldn't be a target, if you know what I mean. So, that's my view on that. I think, just to, so just to reiterate that point, I mean, in terms of material decarbonisation, um, 
when I've looked at them, most of the sort of UK materials roadmaps, and this is all the materials I've looked at, not just concrete, are indicating something like a 20% reduction in carbon on average across those materials by 2030. And of course, the IPCC is telling us we need to halve emissions by 2030. So clearly, that's only part of the picture, and that leaves another chunk. Um, we can use materials far more efficiently. We saw the slide from Nushin that showed that you can get a 30, 40% reduction by going from a flat slab to a two-way slab. And of course, the implications on that are to do with headroom because you've got beams in there, but you can tackle all of that in design early on enough. So, so these things are achievable. Um, and it's just that we have to you know, approach, approach these designs kind of carbon first at the start. And, and I think that there's a, you know, that saying of the right material in the right place in the right quantity is, is really important on this topic. This doesn't mean building everything out of hemp. Right? We're not going to go building our foundations out of hemp anytime soon, I don't think, unless yeah. I've missed an innovation this evening. I've been quite busy today. Um, but yeah, I, you know, there, there are precedents of people hitting REBA targets and there's concrete in those schemes. Um, but it's about using the right material, the right place, and the right quantity, yeah. I'd say. Yeah, and I, I, I'm just going to reiterate, you know, it's, you know, efficient design, and that's done in a number of different, in a number of different ways. Again, you know, I mean, you know, if you look at the, the embodied carbon in the, you know, your, your HVAC equipment in a building, for example, you know, how much can that be simplified? You know, a lot of it can be, uh, gr you know, grossly over-designed, inefficient in, in, in its use as a result of it as well, can simplify ducting and things like that. You know, that can save you, save you a huge amount of carbon. You, you know, the finishers in your building and what you choose as well. So I think it's all about efficiency in looking where... Um, incrementally or, or, or you know your various building elements you can look to reduce and, and the more efficient you're building it you know there's quite a strong correlation between that and cost savings as well you know so I think it can be a bit of a win-win. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say one more question online and then we might have time for one more in the room if we depends how long the answers are I guess um, so on projects to date this is from James Rawlin on projects to date we've had challenges sourcing low embodied carbon mixes with 120 year design lives is the longevity of concretes with GGBS more limited than traditional mixes? Just thinking from a circularity and whole life carbon perspective where reuse and repurpose will become more common with time. So any, um, does it make a difference when you go from a 60 year design life to a 120 year design life if you're using GGBS? Nushin? Well, um, uh, yeah, well it depends. Well, well when you go to BS8500, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's like, it depends how you design your concrete because like you have a table for 50 years, for 100 years, then you can do service life modeling for 120 years, then you will specify based on your required design life basically. So well, it's, it's not that straightforward really. But in short, probably doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Still, so that, that everything we've talked about here, it, this is all concretes, right? Whether you're using them for infrastructure projects, buildings projects, Bridges, foundations, superstructures, it's, you know, there's the same message for all of them, just to be clear. Yeah, Mike? I, I would also add as well, you know, if we kind of look at, you know, the, the trajectory that, that, that we're on to reach net zero by 2050, we've got to achieve an awful lot between now and 2030 if we're going to hit these, cl uh, these uh, cl climate challenge targets. So, you know, in a way, I think we shouldn't be, get too worried about what's going to happen in 100 years' time. We've got to focus on what can we do in the next seven years as a sort of real priority in decarbonizing the assets that we're actually building because the carbon budget that we've actually got to do uh, do that and, and deal with in that time is actually very limited. So we should be striving as much as we can to bring down the carbon emissions of the assets that are actually building over the next few years, and as I say, next seven years, maybe the next next decade, because that's going to be very fundamental in terms of the overall global emissions and how you know whether we reach our uh, 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 you know um, 1.5 degrees. Well, I, th I think 1.5 degrees has gone. I think that's fairly well um, sort of established now, but we need to keep as close to that 1.5 degrees as possible. So the next seven years is very critical. I'm afraid it's only six years, three months, and four days now. Because <laughs> when I started this job, I kept saying 10 years, and then I realised I should probably set a timer. Yes. Um, I think we've got time for one more question in the room, quickest hand. Um, we've got one down at the front from Claire. Right in the front row, please, Zoe. Thank you. Um, right, to my notes, remember what my question was. Um, a mini question on is there any implication on the reusability, like crushing, et cetera, if it has GTBS in it? You know, you hear of some materials that were used in the 80s or whatever, and now we can't reuse them because they've got something toxic in them. I don't think that's the case with GTBS, but just in case. Um, 
one question also, would it be sensible to set a distance limit on imports? Kind of, you know, if we're bringing stuff in from, say, China, and China's definitely going to use it in China, and we're just sort of creating a more expensive market so it's better for them to export it, rather than setting sort of limits that we were talking about before, is there a sort of sensible amount that we should be casting the stuff around the world given the global limit that we've just established? Would sort of distances be a may, maybe useful way of doing that? Um, and just on someone's point earlier about um, sort of specifying concrete mixes and then discovering, quote unquote, that they could only achieve that through 70% GGBS, maybe you shouldn't have set that concrete target carbon limit at that high. <laughs> you, can, you can do some advanced calculations as to how, how a, a carbon limit would be achieved on your concrete mixes. Um, and hence, I, I really like the sort of ABC rating you were talking about before. That sounds helpful for people. Sort of set sensible targets to work towards. Thanks, Claire. So uh, reusability of concretes containing GDBS, any issues, Nusha? I'm not aware of an issue, but I haven't studied in detail about this, <laughs> I should admit. So. Ask us again in 30 years. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> Paul, do you want to um, comment on the, the transportation issues, the transport of GDBS? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, it, it, it would work if you knew where it all came from. But the issue is a lot of GGBS is moved multiple times and then is transported again. So you don't actually necessarily know the point source of its creation. And I think consequently it would be very difficult to manage. It would also mean you'd need to know where each batching plant got their GGBS from in turn. I mean, in an ideal world, we would know where everything we use came from. But actually, if you try and chase the concrete supply chain, it becomes very complicated very quickly. Um, also, to be honest, I mean, from a common point of view of transport, that's relatively trivial. The point I think you're making is trying leaving it in the places that can do more good. Um, I, I don't feel like it would be practical to try and do that, but I, I can see the point. But I, yeah, I think it would be too difficult to try to implement, um, at least at the moment. Yeah, and I, and I think the bigger issue on moving it around might be kind of to, I think, Mike, you made the point earlier, and we touched on this in the paper about how some parts of the world have lower carbon clinkers than others. And if you were in charge of the world's supply of GBS and the world's supply of clinker, you'd probably be choosing to displace the highest carbon clinkers with GBS rather than the lowest carbon clinkers. So I think probably where it gets used in that sense is potentially more important than how far it's travelled to get there, having not done the numbers. I should caveat. Um, so that brings us to the end. Apologies if we didn't get to your question online. I know there was a few still on there. Um, just to sort of like wrap up, I suppose, um, I want to reiterate firstly that this is you know, a big piece of cross-industry research. The ISTRUC T being kind of proud to lead this, but we obviously couldn't have done this by ourselves. And beyond just the three authors who are in front of you, you saw the list of names before, and that network extends out further and further and further. So, um, you know, really great piece of work, really proud to be part of this, and I hope that we get to do more things like this in future. I think that in a... In a it's almost one of the few good things that's come out of the climate crisis actually is seeing competitors work with each other on these important topics, giving me real sort of hope for this industry. Um, this is, I still consider this a niche topic, but clearly it's quite an important one given how many of you have turned up this evening online and in person. Um, so I'm glad that we, we picked it to delve into. We are now talking about what we do next as a group of authors. And as Paul alluded to, if you would like to get involved with things like this, do come and get in touch with us, maybe speak to us afterwards, because um, we're always on the lookout for help. Um, the report in your hands doesn't tell you specifically what to do on every project. I just want to reiterate, it gives you the facts, as far as we know them at this point in time, to the sort of best knowledge that we have. It's now up to you to take that and work out what you're going to do with it. That means speaking to clients, supply chain, your collaborators, the architects you work with, helping them understand that this global picture is probably what matters when it comes to global warming, more than just their project, and work out how you're going to deal with that in your design, which... I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but at least this paper should, should sort of help you with that. But it really is now over to you as to what you do with this. Please do share it with other people and let us know if there's more things we can do to sort of help supplement that. Um, I'd like to, again, thank Paul, Nushin and Mike for speaking tonight. And if we could thank them in the usual way, thank you. <laughs>